<laughs> it's this week in Charles Bronson, the only news and pop culture podcast that revolves around one man's 30 plus year obsession with the late action star. Tonight, we have a very special guest, 40 years in rock and roll, Taryn Scum Punk, a new asshole. He's worked with Gigi Allen, Blow Fly, and even Simon Stokes. Tonight we have, from Anti-Scene, the boy from Brutalsville, the Badwell Ambassador, the king of Destructo Rock, Jeffrey Clayton, all the way from North Carolina. Jeffrey, how you doing? I'm doing good, man. How you guys doing? We good. are doing good. I want to thank you for joining us tonight. I know Thanks. you... Uh, go ahead. Oh, I thought you were saying something. I know you, much like me, you're a fan of uh, uh, kind of low-budget exploitation films, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, uh, Charles Bronson was a pretty big star, but he did do some uh, some kind of uh, kind of low-budget stuff and kind of uh, kind of campy things. And I think this movie Breakout, May twenty first, nineteen seventy five, is no exception. Uh, before yeah. doing this show, were you a Charles Bronson fan before? I asked you to do the show. No, uh, yes, I was, man. Yes, I am. Excellent. I, I'm not a Charles Bronson aficionado, right. but anything that has him in it, I'll pretty much watch it. Right. I've seen him. quite a few. Do you have a favorite? Ah, oh, man, let me think. Oh, yeah, I had pretty cliche to say, but the first Death Wish. Yeah. One of my I like the second one. The third one kind of lost me. I mean, I, I don't it gets know this... a little away from the original story, doesn't it? A little bit. <laughs> now, I mean, part I three is think... one of the most popular ones with um with people. Part three because it's so over the top and so bizarre. Sometimes I like stuff to be crazy and over the top, but sometimes I don't. And I don't know. <laughs> I guess. Right. Uh, Sometimes when they don't intend for it to be, and it is, I like that. But when they intend for it to be, and it it just kind of goes all over the place, I kind of don't like that. I guess, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's got to be a, what kind of mood you catch me in when I'm watching it, I reckon. I understand what you're saying. Like, so, so the Death Wish, um, the Death Wish series started out kind of a dark, kind of, um, you know, 70s, you know, underground New York, dirty, filthy New York kind of feel. And uh, so you kind of want you kind of want to see some, uh, something like that stay on that path. I think a lot of the people who love part three, I think that was their introduction to Bronson because he kind of like came around that came out in like 86. So there was a whole new group of 12 and 13 year old boys who had never, you know, who weren't watching him in 1974 that yeah. were uh, catching those films on video. So there's like. There's like different waves of Bronson. You know how there's kind of like different waves. They say there's different waves of like ska or feminism. There's waves of Bronson. You know what I mean? Yep. That was like second or that was like third wave Bronson. But it's anyway, it happens in the same series. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, in the same series. So tonight we're talking about Breakout. Uh, this movie premiered now different, I, I different, uh, resources some tell me may 21st 1975 tell me, some tell me may 22nd i think may 22nd was the friday and i believe maybe it was released um maybe late on the thursday the 21st maybe is why they, some of them say the 21st well but, uh, oddly enough it's uh the 21st is a wednesday and the 22nd is a thursday hmm. So I don't oh, understand okay. it at all. Cause I, I was looking it up for the billboard stuff and it was right in the middle of the week. So I, I did not know what was happening. <laughs> that might've been something they did at the time. I do know that the movie premiered a month before Jaws. And when Jaws came out, it pretty much dominated it the wiped it um, box off. office for like Man, pretty much. Yeah. yeah. For like months. But this movie and Jaws shared something in common. They both used a new form of publicity called saturation booking, where they not only did they, they, they scheduled it in 1,400 theaters simultaneously, which meant it, it had to premiere in second-run theaters, uh, and then people had to pay first-run theater prices. It was in drive-ins, and they advertised the hell out of it on television and on the radio, and... Um, 
they even spent, I got it written here somewhere, 50 grand to promote it during an Ali Ron Lyle bout. Oh, so wow. they really pushed this film because it was his first film after Death Wish, and he was a hot star. And um, his agent, Pancho Koner, held out for a million dollars up front and a short six-week uh, shooting schedule, and he got it. Um, I was in my mother's stomach. I was born July 1st. Uh, right in the middle of uh, right in the middle of Jaws fever, yeah. So evidently, this was promoted as the greatest escape film ever, which is uh, or no, the greatest, uh, yeah, the greatest escape film ever, which is kind of bizarre because Charles Bronson was in The Great Escape. Is it playing on that? Are they trying to kind of give a little rise to that? I think that quite possibly 1975 wasn't that. Far behind, um, what was the Great Escape? Sixty six. It was definitely sixties. Yeah. Yeah, sixty eight maybe. So yeah, they might have been playing off of that. But uh, to uh, say some more about it, it was based on a real uh, jailbreak. It was. Right. Um, I have that all written down here somewhere. The guy was a, the guy was a sugar mogul, and for some, and he was set up by his family. Um, now he was in jail for uh, quite a while before the escape was uh, planned, but some of the more uh, ridiculous things about the uh, the jailbreak, when I did my research, turned out to be real, which which kind of surprised me. And we'll get to that when we get to the end of the movie. And there's a dog barking in the background. Uh, we'll get that when we get to the end of the movie. But let's just start off with the. Um, the way this movie opens, it opens up with a. Are we able to cut this out, Danny? Because I have a dog barking, and I I should be able to. I, I can right. hear it if a not, little bit. People so can it... enjoy it. It doesn't matter. People yeah. will enjoy it. So it opens up with a. It opens up with a. I'm gonna kill that fucking dog. That's what it opens up with. It That's opens how it started. up. It opens up with a setup, which didn't make a lot of sense to me. Like they they let the guy out of the out of the, the prison van and his friend who's that character actor who plays the Mexican and everything back then. He must have made a fortune playing the uh, heavy set Mexican guy. They <laughs> shot him and then they set up um, Robert Duval's character and I didn't understand how th that setup went down and they didn't really go into much detail with it, did they? I didn't understand that either. Yeah, they're, even in the court they were like this doesn't make any sense. And the judge was like, so what? <laughs> all right. right. And that's all and you're giving me. That's all I'm taking, I guess. And speaking of the court, they mention, <laughs> as they're sentencing him, they let him know that he can have conjugal visits. Mm -hmm. Setting up setting up the many, many meetings that Jill Ireland's character has with him, his wife, to, to plan this jailbreak, <laughs> which was yeah. like, it was insane. They, they were just like, I'd never seen a prison where people could just walk in and um, play in their own jailbreak and walk out. I, I did love that sometimes she had to pretend like she was one of the uh, horde of uh, whores who waited outside. And other right. times she was able to just come right in. It's like, why did she have to do one or the other? Like, it should be all the time one or all the time the other, right? Right. And now the film was originally titled The 10 Second Jailbreak, if anybody cares about that. Um, well, that would have spoiled the ending. It would have spoiled the ending, true, yes. But um, And it was directed by Tom Grise, um, who was more known for um, TV. He did Combat, uh, The Travels of Jamie McFeeters, and even wrote and directed some episodes of The Old Batman. So that's a pretty, he's a pretty, pretty interesting cat. But I think it's, Hollywood interests me because you would think Charles Bronson, he went from a death wish and now he's the most sought after actor, the highest paid actor in Hollywood at the moment. And they, they go with a with a with a TV director, although he had directed movies. Not, he didn't direct any huge hits. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I thought it was interesting, too, that I mean, I, I guess we'll eventually get to the movie, but they put out two movies together in 1975. Yes. He also directed Breakheart Pass, which is a um, based on an Alistair McLean novel, and it's actually one of the better westerns that Bronson's in. And I actually I like 
the director's style. And sadly, he died like a year or two after making this movie at like 54. Yeah, 1977, yeah. And did you know who his father, I mean his father, who his son is? I do not. His son is Uncle Rico from that Napoleon Dynamite movie that all the kids, oh. kids people your age love. I wasn't a big fan of that movie, but that's cool. I don't know that people your age. I'm not sure what age. Oh no, it's I think the it was right people age. my age. Actually, I have no idea. I, I am um, in the right age group. I'm just in the minority on that one. I think. Jeff, are you saying something? I said I, uh, I'm a big fan of it. Are you? Well, you know, he also played at, at King Vidiot in Joysticks, the '80s, um, the '80s. Um, what's it called? The teen romp. And he was um, on Seinfeld, and he also played, I believe, the Wolfman in Monster Squad. Hmm. I saw yeah. Monster Squad. Yeah, I've seen that movie. That movie's cool. Yeah. Now, if you look at a picture of Tom Grise, the uh, director, and you look at his son, they looked a lot alike in the face, if you really look. Um, and so it's a shame. He, um, I believe, Tom, I believe his son is only about maybe 10 years older than me and I'm 47. So I think his son was probably like 10 when his father died. So that's pretty sad or 10 or 12, oh, wow. something like that. Yeah. So that's kind of sad, but um, they mentioned the conjugal visits and um, they use those a couple of times to try to, to try to get them out. But the first escape is they try to use a, a coffin. Remember yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. And that was, uh, I wouldn't, would you let somebody do that even to get out of jail? Uh, I, I don't know that I could trust those guys. I, I don't think I would have wanted to do anything with them. Yeah, they put them in a coffin and then I forget what exactly what happened there. It's kind of weird that I have a podcast about these movies because I have kind of like a, a learning disability where I uh, forget what the hell happened. Well, but, they nail it. They nail the coffin shut and then they actually take you somewhere and bury the coffin. Yeah. That's right. How did he get out? I forget. And I watched the movie three times to prepare for this. <laughs> I watched it twice. <laughs> I watched it today. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff was probably wanting to kill me because I made it. I think he watched it like three months ago. <laughs> I have a habit of doing that, saying, hey, you want to do the show? Giving a person a movie and then like we don't get around to it for a while. It's not easy with a six-year-old and a barking dog and you know it's not easy to do these things jeff you do your own program is it yeah. once a week break on through yeah i do it uh every tuesday at five I do it on facebook live i kind of like i've been i've been catching up on it you had eddie i think his name was eddie from the self-made monsters on yeah uh, rock, uh, another rock and roll band and you yeah. guys did the top 10 like your monsters from monster movies and stuff. Yeah, I do a top oh, ten. That's top cool. ten something every week. Last night you did top ten Alice Cooper albums, and for the fans of Jeff Clayton, he'll he's going to be giving us one of his top tens later when we start talking about the news and pop culture that uh, surround the uh, date of May twenty second, nineteen seventy five. So stay tuned for that. Um, but uh, yeah, I really like I really like that. You're like a you're kind of like a uh, scum rock uh, Casey Kasem over there <laughs> with your top tens. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so Jill Ireland's character, she goes and talks to the to the to uh Robert Duval's John Houston. John Houston plays Robert Duval's. Yeah, grandpa. I thought that was cool. Legendary director. Slummited in this movie, but he's a great, great actor too. And um, yeah, she doesn't seem to catch on after that that he's involved in it like for a while. I don't know if she it ever takes her, it on. Takes her a long time to figure that out. Yeah, and it starts to get kind of boring. Like at some one point in the movie, you want to just jump through the screen and say, grab somebody and strangle them. And I didn't even realize that that was Alejandro Ray until the uh playing the Sanchez that the lawyer to like the third time I watched it. Now he was in Mr. Majestic with Charles Bronson as some of the fans might remember. I don't think that registered to me until right now. <laughs> yeah, Cause he had silver. They put silver stuff in his yeah. hair. We did, and we didn't recognize it. 
That's all it takes. Yeah. <laughs> I understand <laughs> Superman now. <laughs> mm-hmm. A little bit of trivia on John Houston. Yeah. He was uh, in one of the Planet of the Apes movies. Oh, that was he an favorite. ape? That's so cool. Yeah, he was in Battle for the Planet of the Apes at the very beginning and the very end. He played the lawgiver. Oh, no way. Yeah. Oh, and one of our uh, awesome. guests, one of our guests, Richard, didn't Richard Fleischer, the director, we, now we didn't have him as a guest because he's passed, but we had his son and son-in-law on. Didn't he, didn't he direct a Battle of the Apes movie or was that a director of one of the other films um, that we... I got, I got to look it up. He, I think he did one of them, but I, I am not couple, sure which. Yeah. I think a couple the, of the... Guy did battle also directed um, Conquest. Uh, the German fella, I think. I'm terrible with names. But yeah, um, but yeah John Houston played a... I mean, you know, John Houston was a big deal, you know, back then. And for him to do that, I caught a lot oh, of people. Yeah. You know, but um, I thought it was great. I love every eight, so yeah. And you went strange too. You talk about somebody being legendary and popping up in this movie. Robert Duvall had already done The Godfather, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and he, like, I know Charles Bronson, like, it's, it's hard to understand now when you look back at these movies because some of them are so bad. Like, I don't want to call them bad because our, our, our listeners and viewers are or huge Bronson fans like me, but some of them are so bad. It's hard to believe, but he was like the biggest star at the time. But Robert Duvall really looks like he's just cashing the check in this film. He looks very, he looks bored almost. I, <laughs> it, it feels like they wrote him as sick. So he had to do even less. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I wonder if people wanted to work with Charles Bronson that much. I mean, it's, I really, I would love to know more about that. There's not a lot because Bronson was such a uh, private guy. There's not a lot of uh, personal stuff. Um, there was an article that some one of our viewers found and um, or listeners, and uh, he he sent it to me. His name's Gary Norris, just to give him a shout. And it was a it was a write up about uh, Breakout, and they was on the set. There's a story of a a rattlesnake slithering off onto the set and everybody took off and like a bat out of hell, including Bronson. I guess I was supposed to be funny, I guess, because, you know, <laughs> tough Charles Bronson ran off. But some elderly um, firefighter guy came and chopped the head of the snake off. And uh, Charles Bronson asked for the rattle to give to his daughter, Zuleika, which was like his favorite child of his 10,000 kids. But I thought that was a pretty cool story because you don't get a lot of you don't get a lot of private stories about Charles Bronson. So I thought that was a pretty cool on the set story. How popular was uh, was uh, Randy Quaid in 75? I know well, he got later on. I don't know if he was popular, but he, I this is what, what I found interesting when I researched him. He already was nominated for an Academy Award in 1973 for um, either Paper Moon or The Last Picture Show. Um, um, so I don't know that he was his his film career was kind of just starting. His first movie is 1971, mm. but he was he was already up for an Oscar. So I liked him in Breakout. He was great in it, yeah. and like he was the perfect, I guess. So back then, I grew up on all them like 70s kind of like. I, I it wasn't it was kind of a redneck type film like the Burt Reynolds movies kind of like as, as close to one as Bronson did and they always mm-hmm. had that kind of like character like he was Randy Quaid played the kind of like the <laughs> what the character Jerry Reed would have played with Burt Reynolds <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah you know what I mean and I thought he was great in that character and and Bronson was um was surprisingly funny and and kind of charming and, and he kind of, his character was like kind of like that heroic the guy who was heroic, but 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 like also just a, a con artist mm-hmm. and kind of dangerous to himself and others. I mean, he had and, the perfect introduction in this movie for that type of character, where the woman walks up to him and goes, "I'm looking for a pilot named Nick." It's like, who's asking? I'm like, all right, that's <laughs> who you are. I figured you right. out right away. <laughs> right. Yeah, and he kind of his character was kind of like a kind of like Han Solo in a way. 
like yeah. where yeah, basically he's, yeah he's like he's a pilot he's heroic but he's cocky and he's a bit of a grifter bit of a grifter yeah and I, I love I love characters like that. You know, what, what are they? They're smoking fish or something when she shows up? Yeah. Yeah. Ill- illegally? Yeah. And then he keeps taking that check out of his pocket and trying to pay people off with that, that old <laughs> check. Yeah, the whole movie. <laughs> I also what? like, uh, and I don't know how to pronounce her first name, but uh, Sherry North. Mm-hmm. It's I'm either from- Sherry or Sheree. Sharia, um, I don't know what it is, but yeah, I, I really like her in this. Yeah, and she had been around um, since the fifties at that point. Yeah, oh really? Twentieth mm-hmm. Twentieth Century Fox intended her to be the next Marilyn Monroe. I take good notes. She danced in the USO with World War Two at age ten, and she was in a movie called Mardi Gras with Pat Boone in nineteen fifty three. Oh, would you look at that? <laughs> and she was also in Telephone with Charles Bronson. But here's mm-hmm. the, the shootest with John Wayne. And listen to this. Maniac Cop. <laughs> That's a classic. What was that, 82, 83? Yeah, Maniac Cop, yeah, it's got to be somewhere around there. Like, I support... I the theater, man, but... Uh... You saw it in the theater? Maniac Cop, yeah. Oh, wow. Man, yeah, I, I, is 1988. Listen, I'll tell you, I'll tell you guys, man, uh, I remember, I have a pretty vivid memory of when I was a young kid. And uh, I started going to the theaters and the drive-ins with my parents and stuff, man. Uh, I remember seeing uh, Escape from the Planet of the Apes in 71. Uh, at the drive-in, like when it premiered, you know. Oh, oh that'd be so cool. That's that's a perfect drive-in movie too. Yeah, it's great. You know. Oh, um, now I didn't see any of the Charles Bronson movies in the theater except for like Death Wish, uh, two, three, four. But uh, in '75, I mean, I I saw Jaws uh, when it was uh, doing its first run. You know, because, uh, of course, then I was, what, 12 years old. I had to uh, go with other people that would uh, cart us around. But the uh, theater was like our daycare. Yeah. I grew up I grew up in a small town, uh, Albemarle, North. I, I actually grew up outside of Albemarle, North Carolina, in New London, North Carolina. And all through the 70s um, and into the 80s, the the theater was like my mom's uh, daycare, you know, give us a couple, couple dollars, let us off in there, you know, and if we liked the movie a lot, we'd stay and watch it twice. So that's four hours of us out of her hair. Wow. You know, that's when we saw Star Wars, uh, Jaws, all that stuff, you know. I remember 1975 pretty, pretty well. I was born in 1975, and I don't say that to, to make you feel old or anything. I but, don't um, No, you shouldn't. <laughs> And um, you look I'm younger than me. Almost sixty year old, I know. Yeah, but um, um, my I was my parents took me to the drive-in quite a bit, and even at like four or five, because I remember, um, I remember I guess it was a second run of Star Wars. They they replayed it. They they sent they put it back out in like eighty two or something, and I remember I remember it vividly. And they all they started to die off around here. The drive-ins pretty much when I was real young, but they kept one way out um, about 40 minutes from here. But we would, as teenagers, we would drive out there. Um, but the movie theaters were, was, was, yeah, back then, even then though, in the eighties and everything, we could walk to a couple in my neighborhood and yeah, you could walk in and out. And um, a lot of the times they didn't card you. So we'd go see the, the rated R horror movies and everything. And, you know, so yeah, it was it was it wasn't like now you go to these big multiplexes. Like I go and uh, there's like one person working there taking your ticket, selling you your popcorn, and you know because people just don't go like they used to, and they don't. So and uh, Paul Talbot, who wrote Bronson's Loose and Bronson's Loose again, who we had on as a guest over the summer, 
his first film was this movie breakout and um one of our and one of our uh, listeners too it was his first film uh he saw it saw it at the drive-in as well i wish i could remember which listener it was so i could give him a shout out but but yeah i think that's those days are um like they're trying to bring them back like there there's a drive-in uh, about two hours from here that does big events and everything but it's it's a you know that's really cool and all but it's um it's a shame that 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 a lot of those things are dying and even like just watching shows on tv it's like and and and, you know like when i was a kid there was like three channels and so you and and then a couple of uhf channels so you would catch what was on so you knew old movies you knew the marx brothers you knew the three stooges and young people nowadays they don't know anything like a month a month old you know what i mean it's, yeah you know you're talking about the marx brothers and the three stooges uh i'll tell you a film series i used to watch i guess it was from the 40s and i mm-hmm. i've yet to meet anyone who has seen these movies but they were a character named henry aldrich oh. do you guys know anything about that i no. do not but i will look at i will look that up because that's really what this show's all about. It's it's a Bronson is my obsession, but it's a springboard for learning about stuff that people are forgetting. Yeah, Henry like, Aldrich. Henry Aldrich is played by a guy named Jimmy Lydon. Right, and it, it, it was comedy, you know. And uh, every movie started out with his, you know, it it would say Jimmy Lydon in, and all of a sudden his mom's voice would go. Henry, Henry Aldrich. <laughs> and start up and he go, Henry Aldrich and the blah, blah, blah. You know, and there, I don't know how many of them there were, but man, I used to watch those all the time. And I talked to people, hey, man, do you remember the Henry Aldrich? And no one, I, I have not run across anyone who knows that, who knows any of that stuff. He, he had a sidekick named Dizzy. Wow. Um, you know, it, it's kind of in the same vein as, uh, the dead end kid, you know, uh, the mm-hmm. about boys and all that kind of stuff. But right. And I remember not that. As, my dad. As tough guys or nothing. It's, 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 it's probably the precursor to Dobie Gillis. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It might have been a serial. So, like, what they, uh, some of those things from, um, uh, that we would watch on the Saturday afternoons, like the Bowery Boys or even the Three Stooges were these were run before movies. When mm-hmm. people would go to the movies in like the forties or fifties, yeah, yeah, I remember like the Blondie and Dagwood, and mm-hmm. Mickey Rooney had some character he did a lot. He did. I don't know if they were serials or not, but he did some boy Tom something, and it was always yeah, he was know. a child star, which I, I yeah, learned yeah. watching The Simpsons where he comes in and makes a couple jokes about being a child star that I had to look it up and be like, what is he talking about? So they make the first plane escape attempt. Now, we're not going to go through every goddamn thing that happens in this movie, but Bronson gets shot at, and he's a, and he's a he's a little worried about what's going on, and that's where we get the cool funny hat rant. Remember that part where he's like, you see me, you see a guy in a funny hat. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> I really enjoyed that. I wish I would have... Yeah, maybe we can get a sound bite from that. You see this funny hat? I use this to... What does he do? He uses it to... Rain of Mexican gasoline or something. I forget what he said. Yeah, it's a sieve for the something or other. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. He says it pretty clearly. It'll be right when, when the episode comes out. People will hear it. Right. <laughs> It'll be in there. And now there's a child with no shirt on and roller skates and a gun <clears> coming up behind me. Bug, can you take off and try not to make too much noise with those roller skates? Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> and then. We meet Myrna and the sheriff, and Myrna is played by Cherie North, as we already talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's where they come up with the prostitution, the prostitute plan of, of uh, dressing her up as a whore, and they wind up dressing up Dennis Quaid. Now, um, Noah, get out of here. So I, who saw that uh, going wrong? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, foolproof plan, honestly. Right. And when he walks in, why why does he have like why does he not he has no peripheral vision he doesn't see that guard standing there it you know <laughs> there's a handful of moments like that in this movie where it's like they made it so clear 
how did, did nobody they, like, in the movie see it? <laughs> why did they keep? Why did he keep? Uh, why did they keep letting him have visitors? Yeah, right. Yeah, it's very, very bizarre. It's hubris. That's what it is. They're getting and, cocky. They're like, he can't get out of here. Whatever. Let them all try. Right. And then you got yeah. the two that they get to fill up all the female visitors before they go in. Yeah, there was. Yeah, that was a. Uh, yeah, they didn't. I guess they didn't get up to Randy Quaid's uh, stuff there. <laughs> but I don't know. So we had that. And so Bronson, I believe that's when Bronson starts to catch on that he thinks he thinks that uh, Henderson and, uh, you know, the grandfather might be involved. And he also thinks that Joe Ireland might be involved as well. But he definitely he definitely knows he definitely thinks it's a setup. So he shows up at that motel where they're uh, planning, you know, he, he comes storming down the. Uh, where they, they have the scale model of the prison. <laughs> Right, they have a skill jet. Yeah, they, they just yeah. they just have it, you know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, they really put on a show trying to to make Joe Ireland believe that they're going to bust him out. And now the original guy, um, ah shit, I think I got the actor's name written down. The um, I guess he was a lawyer or something. He wanted them to kill um, uh, uh, Robert Duvall's character, but John Huston wouldn't let him. And if they would, they wouldn't just he's, let him. He's so have sentimental. Him killed, it would have been over. You know what I mean? We'd have to deal with that. I, I do love that as it goes. They're like, "Can we do it now? No. Can we do it now? No." <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason to check back in on John Huston in this entire movie is so you can be like, "No, we're not gonna kill him." I believe that's the part of the movie too where you start to see Charles Bronson kind of get a little sentimental over Jill Ireland's character. And he says, I'll do it. For, I'll do it for nothing. Up front. Yeah. <laughs> Remember that? He's like, yeah, how he much are they bunch charging? Of fun lines like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a fun move all around. What did you, uh, all around, what did you think, Danny? It was a fun, was it one of your more? Oh, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I thought he was a lot of fun up until a point where he just kind of stopped having that type of line. And then I was like, oh, Okay, now we're, now we're just kind of talking and whatever. Well, but the whole when... movie kind of falls apart at one point. You kind of like, at one point, you almost want them to give up on, like, you want them to just be like, okay, we're let's just do the last escape here. Like, let's like this. It, it starts to kind of drag out and it starts to feel like they, and, and this happens with a lot of these movies that we watch. They, it feels like they, Almost like they fired writers in the middle of it, and some other people <laughs> yeah. came in and were trying to fix it or something. It, it is you... weird when you see it, and you're like, this turns out to only be about an hour and a half, and you're like, did they just make the last act of this movie really slow so they could get to an hour and a half? Like, yeah, what did you think about that, uh, Jeff? When it kind of did you notice it kind of slowed down after the first couple of escape attempts? Yeah, I mean, like that that whole area in between the attempts is just kind of, uh, you know, we were just talking about just watching it and you just really can't remember it because you're just kind of going, uh huh, you know. Right. I love these attempts; they're they're all great, you know. <laughs> but, right. uh, I mean, now, right up until Bronson gets on the helicopter for that last one, it's like. Can we just get here? And then when he's on the helicopter, I'm like, let's do this. But like right, right. all that time in between. And then like I, I don't want to jump too far ahead, but it doesn't really matter. Like anybody I say this every episode. Anybody watching this knows the movie anyway, but there's a, a, a scene where they're stuck in customs. Like that's boring in real life. Why would you do that in a movie? Yeah. Yeah. And like to have like two steps in that ending where like it's not just the bad guys waiting for them. Like it's actual legit customs people. They're not in on it. They're not running any any game. And yeah. then the guy shows up because they just happen to be stuck at the right customs place and like they could time it right, I guess. Right. And when we get to the towards to the end, I'm going to I'm going to give you a pretty big surprise about that scene. But uh you know, if you were home that night, Jeff, you might been you might have been watching CBS's The Waltons, an episode called The Birthday, or you might have been watching something called Primal Man on ABC, which I could find nothing about. I have no idea 
how that's possible with the internet. I know a lot about that. What's that? I know, you know a, lot. a lot about it. Yes. Oh, what was Primal Man? It was only um, four episodes. It was a it was a caveman program. Okay. Okay. It was a a documentary thing. No, it was acted out. Oh, okay. It was acted out. Uh, matter of fact, um, my friend uh, Janice Blythe, who is also Ruby in The Hills Have Eyes, she starred in a couple of the four episodes. Did she really? Yeah. That, and now, now check that this that's out. Something, that's something I would have loved to have found out before this, because I know you're friends with her. Yeah. Well, I, know I, you, I had no uh, idea you were going to bring up Primal Man. That's another one. I, that, I taught her, hey, did you ever see Primal Man? No. Why is there only four episodes? Well, I'll tell you. Uh, they were going to do some scenes where they needed a different terrain. And they packed up the entire crew. And I'm talking film crew, film equipment, actors, everything. Uh, they told Janice that they wouldn't be filming her character like like where her character and, and a few other people live. So they didn't need to go on this trip. And she was like, oh, okay. Well, the plane took off from a little, uh, almost like a private airstrip. Uh, it got up a few few thousand feet and then went straight to the ground and killed everybody on the plane. Oh, wow. 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 And I remember there were only being four episodes, you know, and I like, I like cavemen stuff, you know, I like cavemen, ape, dinosaur, all that stuff. And, uh, and I just remember it being on the news. And I remember, uh, my parents talking about it, like, Oh wow. That whole, the, the whole cast of that show was, killed in a plane crash you know and it just it was wild janice could have been on there and she wasn't if she was one of the people in one of the other tribes that they were filming yeah she she could have been on that plane too that's wild. i love how you kind of like like so anti scene's got a song based on her character in the hills have eyes and you you somehow made a friendship with her and kind of almost like a collaboration there where your fans are buying her stuff and I'm sure her fans are buying your stuff. That's really cool. Yeah. I mean, it only took 35 years. She, <laughs> she always asked me, uh, why didn't you ever get in touch with me? You know, because I wrote the song after seeing the Hills have eyes too. But I told her, I said back, back in 1985, 86, we had no idea how you would get in touch with an actor or an actress. That's amazing. You know, Jeff. Like, like I, literally had a guy on here juan fernandez who worked with oliver stone who mm -hmm. was in miami vice who was in crocodile dundee 2 who's directed and and and, the, and i literally emailed him i found his website emailed him and literally in 10 minutes i'm sitting at my dad's house and i'm telling my dad i'm joking with my dad i'm like dad i'm talking to juan fernandez the guy was the bad guy in Charles Bronson's Kinjata, or Kinjit, Kin, however the hell you pronounce it. And I'm joking with my dad about it. By the time I got home, he had agreed to do the podcast. Mm. And our next guest, I'm reading his book right now, Blue uh, Tales of, or whatever, Blue Collar Actor, Jordan Rhodes, uh, North Carolina boy, worked on tobacco mm. farms. He's 83 years old. He was on, he was in every, everything, Mr. Majestic, and he was in Charles Bronson's last film. He was in, Mr. Majestic, which came out in 1974, the height of Bronson's fame, and he was in his last movie, Indian Runner, mm -hmm. um, his last movie in the theaters. And um, he's, you know, I, I literally found his home phone number on a website, called, talked to his wife. Next day, he calls me. Like, it's amazing what's going on out there. And it's almost, it's like, I just, I, I'm besides myself. It's amazing, isn't it? It's cool to be yeah. friends with people like that, too. Mm -hmm. like, I, I wouldn't want to be friends with, I wouldn't know what to do with a friendship with Brad Pitt, but like mm. somebody who's like a, like a character actor, those, those people that were in those things that mean so much to you, like the Hills have eyes or mm -hmm. she was in eaten alive too, which is yep. another one of my oh, favorites. Right. And yeah. the uh, incredible melting man. Oh yeah. Like how neat is that? It's, it's really neat, man. She has told some great stories and like, you know, anytime you speak to, 
people that, you know, a bit older than you telling you stories and stuff. Um, when it's all said and done, you're always kind of going, God, I wish I had recorded this. Yeah. Like, like I had a friend, uh, his name was Mr. Bandana. He was the, uh, he was stage security for years. Mm -hmm. I remember when he passed, I remember seeing that on Facebook. For for Hank Williams Jr., he worked for Waylon Jennings. He worked for David Allen Co. He sat in this kitchen one night and told me and my wife stories for hours. And then when it's all over, you know, and I got a phone. We got phones now recording. I was like, why didn't I record this? Right. You yeah. know. But when you're busy living the moment, you don't think too much about documenting it, I guess. But um, right. And that's what's cool but, about like the program like this. You know what I mean? Or or what you do, even your break on through thing, like. Like, I know, I don't know if you can have people on the way I do, like remotely, but I know you've had some people, you had people in there and it's, it's, um, you know, like I wanted to do a, a show where I got to talk about all these things that I liked, but I, I only thing I'm kind of, kind of an expert in is Charles Bronson. Cause I was obsessed with him when I was young. So mm -hmm. I said, well, he's worked with everybody. It'll open the doors. I mean, this guy, Jordan Rhodes, who's going to do the next show. I didn't even think of looking him up because a lot of these movies, when I look everybody up, everybody's gone. Everybody's dead. Everybody's passed. This guy, you talk to him on the phone, 83 years old. Sounds like he's just getting started. He's mm. he's trying to get some kind of thing on Broadway. He's writing this. He's doing that. Like, it's amazing. It's cool. Great. As well. That's awesome. You know, if you were home that night, Jeff, I think you might be watching the Mac Davis show. Is that Does that sound like something you'd be watching? I've, I I did watch the Mac Davis show. Yeah. Uh, uh, he always did stop and smell the roses uh, as the intro. Yeah. Well, that night, that night, he had Gladys Knight and the Pips on and they did feeling all right together. He sang rolling in baby's arms that night. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they had some comedy skits on there. And I believe uh, who were some of the comedy writers that he had? He had Jimmy, I think Jimmy J.J. Walker and Gabe Kaplan were early comedy writers for those Mac Davis shows. I know you're a fan of going on to Tubi and watching the the movies, like me watching the the old movies. Have you gone and watched any of these old shows, like the Mac Davis? I don't know if Mac Davis is on there, but I watched like some of those Pat Boone. Uh, man, man I I I own DVD sets of a lot of that stuff, like Tony Orlando and Dawn and Sonny and Cher. Oh, nice. Man, I that, love that. I mean, that that was. I don't know. I don't know why I have such uh, nostalgia for the time period, but man, it's like um, talking about 1975. For, for me, it seems like 73 to the very beginning of 78 was such an uh, influential time for me. And it, everything, everything that I kind of got into or that got into my, you know, mindset back then, it, it, it has all stayed with me until like today. Right. And then, and then, and then a, another wave came and uh, like late 79 to, to 80, 82, 83, you know, just the stuff from that period. And um, I just think it's amazing. And like when I was com um, compiling, uh, a lot of the records that were released in 75, I realized, you know, I still listen to these records. I probably listen to a, a track or two off, off of them today. You know, yeah. most uh, of my favorite music is from around that time that I was born. Um, mm -hmm. It just happened that like, as I got, when I was in my teen years, I started, uh, well, and a lot, and a lot of time talking to older people too. Like, like when I met whiskey rebel and Marla, like they, mm -hmm. they turned me on to a lot of things. I was like 20 when I met them. So, um, while we're on it, how about you? How about you run down your favorite albums in 1975? Well, there, there's, there's, um, there's two lists here. There, there are the ones that, um, that I had in 75, you know, at some point in 75 or early 76. So I was listening to them while they were new. But then there's others that I discovered as I got older, you know, because like at 12 and 13 years old, you know, doing a lot of odd jobs, collecting money. And a lot of it uh, was through trades at school. You know, we would trade wrestling magazines and records and 
Force Playboy and Penthouse and stuff like that. And that's how I got a bunch of these records. But um, in, in no particular order, these are the ones that I listened to or owned uh, that year. Uh, one was Aerosmith, Toys in the Attic. Um, Alice Cooper, Welcome to My Nightmare. Kiss Alive and Dress to Kill. Dress to Kill was first, and then Alive pretty much changed the landscape for them. From then on, uh, The Who by Numbers. Uh, let's see what else here. I'm just trying to tell you the ones I listened to then, not the ones I discovered later. Uh, the the self titled uh, Ted Nugent. Um, I, I don't think I was big a big fan then, but I heard this stuff everywhere, like the Four Seasons, the, the Who Loves You album. They had two two songs in the top forty then, uh, Who Loves You and and uh, December sixty three. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I swear, those are still songs I listen to probably at least once a week. And later. In life, I discovered these. I mean, I, I probably heard some of it on the radio, like the the Eagles. One of these nights, they they were all over the place. Oh, um, yeah. uh, that's when Queen uh, "Night at Opera" came out, one of their most popular albums of all time. I didn't discover that till a few years later. Patti Smith's "Horses," something I discovered. Fleetwood Mac's. Uh, it's not their debut album, but it's the the hit making lineups debut album. Right. Mm-hmm. That was that was everywhere. Uh, Parliament Funkadelic, Mothership Connection. Um, uh, Frank Zappa did Bongo Fury that year with Captain Beefheart. Donna Summers, Love to Love You Baby. Um, and then stuff I discovered much later, like Curtis Mayfield's No Place Like America Today, Bob Marley Live, Nazareth, Hair of the Dog. Oh, yeah. Cher, Stars, Robin Trower for Earth Below, Frampton's debut. Most people learned about Peter Frampton when Frampton Comes Alive came out. Comes Alive, yeah. Because every other song was a hit on the radio. And um, uh, the Hall & Oates album called, um, people just call it the Silver Album, which had uh, Sarah Smile. So, oh, yeah. His own. Oh, yeah. that, that's all that's all stuff I, I i still listen to this very day it's amazing to look at like when we do this show especially especially when we do a 70s episode um we did chato's land which was 72 and i mean i think some of the things that stuck out for me i think deep purple might have had an album that year um of course that kiss had two albums i mean they were like charles Brown's bronson had three movies out that year they had two albums um I know it's not the hippest thing for a punk rock guy to say, but Steely Dan's Katie Lied came out in 75. I love that album. Yeah. Like, it's just... I do, too. I love yeah. Steely Dan. Yeah, it's freaking amazing, man. And it, and in the theater that year, Race with the Devil was one of the films with Peter Fonda and Warren Oates. That's a classic. And the Apple Dumpling Gang. Oh, that's nice. That in theater that year. Yeah, Apple Dumpling Gang. And I loved that movie when I was a little boy. Yeah, and, I did too. Uh, yeah, and um, but it premiered the same night as something called The Happy Hooker. I have seen The Happy Hooker. You have? <laughs> the, the Happy Hooker is a series of movies. Oh, there's like a Happy Hooker goes to Washington kind of thing. Yeah, they, they, <laughs> they starred that lady, uh, Xavier Hollander, mm-hmm. and she was she was the Happy Hooker, and um, yeah, she was pretty popular back then, of course. Uh, parents weren't taking me to see the happy hooker yeah. which i i saw it because a friend of mine found it in like a, a used bin at a thrift store and was like let's see what this is and you know it's fairly innocuous like there's there's nothing crazy about it that like it's just a 70s movie like there's nothing yeah and it looked like it, it was pretty popular i think it was the number one movie that weekend i believe I well, wouldn't you know, be surprised. I did look up stuff back then. Yeah. Um, I do remember big ad campaigns for uh for Dog Day Afternoon. Oh yeah. Rollerball. Rollerball, yeah. Shampoo. 
Shampoo, there you go. And uh, Death Race 2000. Um, oh, yeah. Which you like, just watched like, the other night, correct? Uh, I just watched it the other night. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, love I've that seen movie. It before, that movie's so I good. Watch. That movie is incredible. See, I just like, like everything. Music, uh, film, everything from back then. It's, it's such... It, I don't know if you say influence, but it just became a, a part of my my being. Um, I feel like people were trying harder to entertain us back then, where I think now everybody, including me, you know, I, I, I got this stupid thing, right? Everybody's got something like this. Um, hopefully this is entertaining the people and it's and it's informative. But there's a lot of shit out there. And back well, then, I think there was less channels, less less everything. Do you know what I mean? Like you were mm. talking about the Sonny and Cher show and um, Tony Orlando and Dawn, like legendary comedians like Steve Martin, George Carlin, they all wrote for those shows. So you're really watching, you know, and there were, there wasn't like everybody and their mom couldn't pick up a phone and be a comedian or be a superstar. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in a way it's cool. Because I could sit here and do a Charles Bronson podcast <laughs> with my friend. Yeah, but, but no, at the no same barrier time, to entry. Yeah, that's right. So that it's really neat. cool. It's really cool. But at the same time, like people aren't trying as hard. Like I remember, you probably don't didn't have any of these, Danny. But like kids shows, like with a host, like the Uncle Floyd. Not show really. No, like yeah. the like the Bozo the Clown kind of. Captain Variety. Noah, Captain Kangaroo, yeah, like the like those people took nothing and worked really hard to make it entertaining. Yeah, we uh, we had Mister Rogers, but everybody had Mister Rogers. Like that was that was basically it, though. Like I can't think of another one. There was like that like, was kind of a low budget happened. thing. Like that's what that was kind of a low yeah that was kind of a low budget do it yourself type thing. Yeah, Michael well, yeah. Keaton worked on that. Uh, as a young kid, I watched. Um... Bozo the Clown and uh, Captain Kangaroo, and uh, we used to have Romper Room. Yes, yes, I remember Romper Room <laughs> and the Man of Split. Romper yes. Room, which I basically only know as the thing Charles Bronson said in that one movie, <laughs> Murphy's Law. He's just, yeah. what, is what is this, this Romper Room? room? <laughs> 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 All right, before we get to the end of the, the end of this film, because Jeff and I want to need to go to bed. And and everybody's seen this goddamn movie anyway. Jeff, where 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 can people see Anti Scene, and where can they get some of your cool stuff? I know you got a Conqueror Worm, the album that you did with. Um, I know that's not Anti Scene, but the album, the band that you did, um, tribute to Simon Stokes, and uh, with a lot of uh, legendary uh, punk rock people. Um, yeah, a big champion from Poison Ideas on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Me and the Whiskey Rebel uh, did mm -hmm. that as a trip to Simon Stokes. Um, I I don't know. Maybe you think, oh well, you're tooting your own horn here, but I think we helped bring Simon Stokes out of obscurity. Oh, definitely, definitely, yeah. And um, which if if that's one of the feathers I can put in my cap, then I'm a happy happy guy because people mm -hmm. really needed to hear that stuff, man. It was and like like I said, you know, like like Janice asking why didn't I get in touch in '85? Well, here we were in what '90. 93 94 and trying to track down simon stokes i mean man we we called jello biafra we called cub coda from brownsville wow. station you know Cub coda yeah yeah you know we we call these people on the phone hey ben, do you wow. know anything about simon stokes <laughs> but but yeah people can get that and any of the anti-scene uh stuff um at anti-scene.com where we just launched our brand new uh anti store anti scene store at big cartel it's it's on the website so you can go straight to it and uh everything's on there every everything that i have that people can purchase it's on there nice. down south you guys got like three shows coming up in early november correct yes sir and then uh about 10 days later uh it might be too early to to reveal this but we have some dates that are getting solidified with uh, the obsessed and and i hate god some i hate gods on some of them but i think we're playing with the obsessed just about every night wow 
Excellent. Excellent. I hope to get out to see you guys again sometime soon. Well, I, and, uh, I, we, we may get up your way soon. So, well, if you get up, if you get up this way, I'm definitely going to get out there. Yeah. I don't no. get out. <laughs> I don't get out as much as I used to, but I definitely no. will. All right. So let's just jump to the, we meet Harv. I like the character Harv, the, the helicopter guy. Yeah. I don't know why. He's a throwaway. I, I like that character. he stood his ground at the end. You like what? I like that he stood his ground finally. Where he, right. The whole time he was, he's getting pushed around, getting tricked, getting convinced. And he's like, you know what? No. I like my no. life. I'm not fucking this up for you. <laughs> right, right. And so they, they, you know, they, they, uh, oh my God. They go, so they go and they're, they plan the last final, the final escape. Get out of here, dude. And, um, and uh, they head to Mexico, um, where they take Cherie North with them, and she makes some very uncomfortable rape jokes, like about three of them in a row. Yeah, <laughs> but that was the position they put her in, though. Like, yeah, it's a very strange, very strange. But that was the times, I guess. Like you know, mm. the different times. Yeah, um, all that, and then. Oh man, we're not gonna cheat. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> now, were you disappointed in Bronson's character at that time? And did you think that he? Would, were we supposed to believe that his character had the hots for Jill Ireland? Do you think, or do you think he just was being a good guy? I don't know. You know like I don't like she assumed that, but I didn't really. I I got that he was feeling sympathetic for her. And I felt that he was, he took a shine to her, but I didn't feel this like big chemistry. It, it it felt more to me that he took it personally that the other guys set him up. That like when that clicked and he realized that like she's probably not part of this, that was yeah. more because he got tricked that he was like, all right, I'll do this for you. But like it's not really for her, it's for him. So, he flies the helicopter. We'll just get to that. They paint it up to look like a Mexican police helicopter. And then they just happen to have the outfit. <laughs> yep. He flies in, picks him up, and leaves, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, the research I did, evidently, that's exactly what happened. Which is, 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 is almost as insane as this next part. You wonder to yourself, how did this guy just walk away? You know what I mean? At the end. Well, in real life, he did. Evidently, in Mexico, if you break out of jail, or at the time, if you break out of jail and no one is hurt, you're a free man. That's what hmm. I read. Is that the strangest thing? And also because they actually did go through customs and use their real names. So that whole customs thing like was pretty much real except for the you know the bad guys showing up and all that which is where you get the um should we just jump to the the grand finale oh with... the the one crazy kill in this whole movie <laughs> <laughs> for some odd reason so that that lawyer guy shows up charles bronson tackles him now 47 year old eric watches it and i'm just like God, that's so weird. But when I was <laughs> when I was like thirteen or fourteen, and I saw that for the first time, oh my god, I must have rewound it ninety times. That was just the coolest fucking thing. The guy gets just chopped to bits by an airplane propeller, absolutely yeah. obliterated. And it's just in seconds. It looked like they made a man out of rubber and styrofoam, and I mean, it just. Bloop. Oh, he like dispersed like confetti. It was, yeah, <laughs> it was something else. It was not a person, <laughs> right? It was one of I, I love that ending. It's bizarre, and then, you know, Robert Duvall says thanks, and that's it. Yeah, but you know, you, you know, they were doing that. There's kind of uh, over the top killings and stuff like in Death Race two thousand. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. But Death Race two thousand is a Roger Corman film. Do you know what yeah. I mean? And yeah, mm -hmm. that was going for camp start to finish. Right, right. right. And but then, then of course, there's the, what's that? <laughs> then there's the like Scooby Doo type ending where they all just kind of laugh, laugh it off. Like you, 
you realize, okay, it's back to Bronson, you know, Nick Colton, Hawk, Randy Quaid, and Sheree North. It's back to the old gang, and they're just back to whatever. Joe you know, Ireland's it, gone. It, it's all over. If this were today, that would be setting the three of them up for like another caper for a sequel. Oh, I know. <laughs> Bronson, Bronson didn't get sequels out of anything but but Death Wish, and um, you know that's a conversation that we've had a few times on the This Week in Charles Bronson Facebook page. If anybody's new, we do have a Facebook page, and the conversation is films that you would like to see a sequel to. And um, this one never came up, but yeah, I'd like to see the character Nick Colton again. You know, yeah, I, I wasn't able to participate in that conversation because I didn't know a ton of the movies at that point. But more and more, I'm like, I think a lot of these would benefit from a sequel where they could kind of write the ship a little bit, but also spend some no more time with the characters because the characters aren't usually bad. Just the movies do a lot of crazy, crazy stuff. Well, that's why I wanted to do this podcast so too. So like, I don't, necessarily want a lot of guests that are Bronson fanatics I love to get people on that never seen one before and then they see this shit you know what I mean like Kinjata we had Juan Fernandez on but yeah. I want to do I want to do that movie with a, a young person who's never seen a Bronson movie eat the watch with, with the shit that okay. happens in that movie he makes a guy eat a watch and he <laughs> insults a guy with a dildo mm. yeah. yeah he does <laughs> does all in the name of justice jeffrey clayton yeah and he was a cop so <laughs> he was, he was allowed to <laughs> and after he assaults the guy with he comes home and says i did something that i think might jeopardize my pension <laughs> <laughs> and his wife is like not again <laughs> <laughs> i haven't seen this one i, I want to see that. <laughs> yeah check out Kinjata, the forbidden subjects, and the main bad guy in it, Duke. He's amazing, and we had him on here. Fantastic and, um, dude. Yeah, he was fantastic. He was uh, he was everything you'd want more. Uh, I didn't do much interviewing. He just he took over, and it was great. Yeah, but listen, I want to thank our guest tonight, the great rock and roll punk rock legend Jeffrey Clayton of Anti Scene. Well, thanks for having me, man. I enjoyed it. Yeah, this was a lot of fun. We got it in. We got out. How about we give it? A, how about we rate it? Uh, let's let's give it one to one to four mustaches. How many mustaches do you give it, Clayton? Yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and give it four mustaches. Oh my God, that's a high rating. How about you, Danny? I, um, I mean, I I always forget what I rated the other ones that I liked. So we went up, to... we were, we, we've gone above. We we've the, the rating system changes every time because I think one time we went from a half a mustache to like five. It I, doesn't. I think matter. one time I nobody gave a makes movie it this far. Eight. I What's don't remember. That? I think I gave a movie an eight one time. I don't. Did we? I All don't right. remember. But one to either one way. to ten mustaches. <laughs> this is a it's a half mustache below Mr. Majestic, and I think I think whatever I gave Mr. Majestic, this is a half mustache lower because. It doesn't make a ton of sense, but it's as much fun. Yes, I it believe is, it. It's, it, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I and, like you it. know what? I is is boring as is as much as it slows down in the middle there. If I would have saw this movie like in a drive-in or a theater when I was a kid, I would have loved it. It was right. It's right up my alley. Oh, my so yeah, name. I'm gonna give it. Yeah. I'm gonna give it like three and a half mustaches and maybe a bullet. Maybe an airplane propeller. I don't know. We just do whatever we want. <laughs> yeah, Jeff, no, number is... three and a half with an airplane. <laughs> well, this has been This Week in Charles Bronson. I want to thank our guest, Jeff Clayton of Anti-Scene. Thank you, Jeff. Hey, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. All right, Danny Getz, my teenage counterpart. Thank you. <laughs> I love being called teenage. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> good night, guys. All right, good night.